morning. I'm glad to see you all here. If you signed up for the 8 o'clock section, that either means you're a morning person or you registered too late, right? Because there's also a 9 o'clock section. So I think probably, I'll just assume that everybody here is a morning person and that your bright, shining faces means you're excited for fluid mechanics. I'm excited. Um, my name's Dr. Waite, and uh, this is probably the 20th time I've taught this class. I really like fluid mechanics a lot. Um, the first time I taught it, this was the first class I ever taught. And actually, um, I'm not new to AUS. I was at AUS starting back in 2005. I was here for a few years, then I moved back to the United States. And now I'm back temporarily just for a one-year sabbatical. So I'm really happy to be here. I'm looking forward to getting to know each one of you a little bit better. Uh, let's go through some announcements before we begin with the new material. We have a lot to cover this semester, and I want to uh, get an early start on it. I'm going to try and give you an announcement slide like this at the beginning of every class, just so that you're always very clear on what the assignments are, what you should be studying. I want to try and make it as easy as possible for you to keep track of the course. You also notice I'm wearing a microphone. And the reason for that is that I record each class meeting, and then I post the video online. So that uh, if there's something I was explaining and you didn't understand it the first time, you can watch the video you know, whenever you like, as many times as you want. I had one student last semester say that he watched all of the videos before the uh, midterm exam, and his mom heard this new voice in his room and was wondering, who are you talking to in there? So it was me. It was my voice, yeah. Here's some announcements. Uh, the first thing, here is our textbook. You should buy it, or I think there's an electronic version that you can buy online if you prefer the ebook. Either one is fine, but uh, you definitely will need it. Uh, also, I've distributed homework number one to you. Here is the paper for it. The paper is also found on iLearn. And iLearn is where you're supposed to submit this assignment, and it's due 48 hours from right now. Actually, it's due 47 hours and 57 minutes, all right? Because it needs to be uploaded to iLearn before class begins. It's something very easy. I'm just asking about your background, some basic information about, uh, like, what do you think fluid mechanics is about, just to get your impression of the course, and then some things you can look up off of uh, Google very easily, like what's the pressure at the, the deepest part of the Pacific Ocean, something like that. It will take you 15, 20 minutes, all right? But it will not be accepted late. None of the assignments this semester will. So it needs to be uploaded to iLearn. Don't email it to me, don't print it out, only upload it to iLearn. And if you're not sure how to do that, I'm sure one of your friends can show you or I can show you. Just come to my office. My office is on the third floor of the main building. So um, you'll be in for a hike if you come to visit me, or I guess an elevator ride, either one. Just looking a little bit further into the future, here's our second assignment. So it's due one week from today, homework 2A. Uh, after today's class, we're going to do some calculations today that you can start working on homework 2A. So the best way to be successful this semester, don't procrastinate. Uh, the best way to be unsuccessful, don't study, procrastinate, have a bad attitude. There's lots of ways to failure, but there are fewer paths to success. And I'll try and point out the paths to success this semester when there's a, a good one. And one of them is get an early start on the homework. So any questions on these announcements before we start talking about fluid properties? All right. We'll go over some more of the paperwork towards the end of class. I like to have the important things first. Fluid mechanics is important. Paperwork, a little bit less important, OK? All right. So <clears throat> this semester, we're going to work almost entirely in SI units. I'll only occasionally mention what are known as the British gravitational units, just because it's a curiosity. And some of you may end up going to graduate school in the United States. Um, from the students I taught when I was here at AUS before, maybe about 10% of them ended up in the U.S. You're going to get a master's degree or a Ph.D. So just once in a while I'll mention the equivalent traditional units, which is based on the English system. Uh, of course, we all know that mass is measured in kilograms, but 
In the traditional units, those are pounds mass, or sometimes they're called slugs. Those are two different things. Those are two different measures of mass. The length is a meter. And one of the reasons I'm showing you all of these units is that in all of the calculations I do this semester, I'm always going to show the units. If I stray away from that habit, you remind me that I'm supposed to be writing the units in every calculation because it's a very good way to identify your mistakes before you make them. You know, if you don't write your units, then you might have the wrong thing. You might put centimeters when really you need to have meters. You could be writing grams if you really need kilograms. And so always including the number and then the unit that goes along with the number is a very good habit for engineers. So in traditional units, we have feet, inches, yard, mile. And they're just ridiculous. These traditional units are silly. Like a foot is about the length of a foot. I guess that makes sense. But why there are 12 inches in a foot instead of 10, I don't know. Anybody know how many feet are in a mile? It's a nice round number, 5,280. Strange, right? Very weird. All right, time is seconds. There's also seconds in traditional units. Now, here's where we're going to use some of these units a lot this semester. And one of them is a Newton. And um, a Newton, of course, is a kilogram accelerated at one meter per second squared. So that's the, the amount of force required in order to accelerate a one kilogram mass at that acceleration rate. And so sometimes I'll write Newtons, and sometimes I'll write kilogram meter per second squared. And I'll write that usually when I'm intending to cancel units out. Like if I'm putting lots of units together and I, I'll expand the units to show how they later on cancel out. Um, so in traditional units, a force is a pound of force, which is different from a pound of mass. And of course, G, this semester we're going to write G is 9.81 meters per second squared. Even though actually gravitational uh, acceleration varies a little bit over the surface of the Earth very slightly. Um, we're just going to assume 9.81. All right, so let's continue with these units. Um, one kilogram has a weight of 9.81 newtons. And of course, weight and mass are different because mass is a unit of how much stuff there is, and weight is a measure of the force exerted by that stuff. And so when a kilogram is being exerted to Earth's gravitational acceleration, then it exerts a force of 9.81 newtons. Sometimes when we're doing gas laws and uh, in fluid mechanics, there's liquids and gases. Those two things are fluids. And so sometimes we'll do calculations with gases. And oftentimes when we're doing gas calculations, we have to use our te temperature measurements in Kelvin rather than in degrees Celsius. And so to switch between the two, you probably remember this from chemistry. 273.16 is zero Celsius. And so if you want to get Kelvin from a measurement in degrees Celsius, then you just add this constant to it. And then you can convert between the two. Uh, if we're measuring work or energy, we use units of joules. And a joule is the amount of energy that's exerted if you apply a newton of force across one meter. So if I had, a, uh, if I had something in my hand, like a weight in my hand that it was exerting one newton down, and I lifted it one meter, it would take one joule in order to accomplish that work. And a a power is when we put the uh, time units into, uh, into account, like it's the, the rate that work is being accomplished. And so, you know, let's think about me lifting that weight. If I lift it one meter and it takes me one second to do that, then I've exerted a watt. That's the rate that I'm burning energy. But if I lift it in half a second, because I'm you know, doing it more quickly, then it would take two watts to do that, because I'm exerting the joule in half a second. So then that would make it two watts to do the, the amount of work that's described. Any questions on this slide so far? I like questions. I encourage questions. So anytime you've got them, I'm going to be very pleased. All right. Sometimes I won't know the answer to every question. 
but uh, I'll always do my best to, to figure it out if I don't know. All right, density. How many of you have already had a materials class in engineering? Have you taken like civil engineering materials or strength of materials, anything like that? No? Okay. Mass density is when you are trying to figure out um, how much stuff there is in a certain volume. And um, steel, for example, is very dense. A small cube of it would exert a pretty big force in my hand. But if we had a cube of plastic that's the same size, it would be easier to lift a cube of plastic than a cube of steel. And the reason for that is steel has a high density. It has a high amount of mass for every unit of volume. And so the typical units for mass are kilograms. And the typical units of volume that we're going to use this semester in uh, fluid mechanics are cubic meters. Now, of course, there's other units as well. There's grams per uh, cubic centimeter. Um, but kilograms per cubic meter is what we'll use most often. So let's think about water, since water is the, uh, the fluid that civil engineers deal with the most. You know, mechanical engineers have to deal with a lot more fluids than we do. Uh, they're dealing with oils, hydraulic fluids air more commonly. We use air in our calculations sometimes, but for civil engineers, water is the most important fluid. So at 10 degrees Celsius, and also at 5 degrees Celsius, but uh, at 10 degrees Celsius, the density of water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. I'm not going to ask you to memorize too many constant this semester, but if you don't already know that, 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, that's one of the few constants this semester that you should memorize. All right. Sometimes that won't be provided in a quiz or an exam. I'll just assume that you've done enough homework assignments where you had to use that, uh, that you already know it. Now, sometimes at other temperatures, it's not that same density. I'll show you a slide in just a moment that goes over that fact, that the density of water changes as a function of temperature. But if you're not told the temperature, and you just go with the standard 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So most of you probably have already thought about density, but specific weight is something different, gamma. So gamma, or specific weight, is when we're multiplying the density of a fluid by gravity. Now, if we're on Earth, and we are, we're going to use g of 9.81 meters per second squared. And so, the gamma for water is 9810 newtons per cubic meter. So where does that, these units come from? Okay, so we say gamma is density times G. Okay, density was 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And by the way, uh, for these handouts, the reason why I've provided like the blank space over here is just if you want to take notes, that's a good spot to do it. By default, it puts lines when you do three per slide, but I blank those out just to make it a little bit easier for you to use all the space. All right, so 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, and then G is 9.81 meter per second squared. All right, so here, we're saying that the, the gamma units are newtons per cubic meter. Remember, a newton, what's the definition of that? Kilogram meter per second squared. Okay? So, if we have kilogram meter per second squared as a newton, then we divide that by uh, meters cubed, you can see that this is going to cancel out since it's the numerator, and that should just be meters squared. And that's what we've got here. Kilograms, this meter is going to be canceled out, canceled out with that one, and then second squared in the denominator. So that's where the units come from for uh, specific weight, 9810 newtons per meter cubed. And that's another one that you should uh, memorize. That I wouldn't provide that in a uh, quiz or in an exam because we're going to use it so much this semester. You probably won't have to set up a flashcard for yourself. You'll just memorize it naturally. 
I said earlier that there's two main uh, categories of fluids. There are uh, liquids and then there are gases. And uh, through the semester, sometimes we'll compare liquids and gases. And one of the ways that we distinguish between the two is that liquids, like water, are not as compressible as air is. Now, they're a little bit compressible, but very, very slightly. Uh, it's much more difficult to compress liquids than it is to compress gases. Um, sometimes we'll say that liquids are incompressible. And strictly speaking, that's not true. They're a little bit compressible. But um, just because they're so slightly compressible, that doesn't mean that they always have the same density. And the reason for that is that uh, you can add salts, like uh, sodium chloride, and that increases the density of water. Uh, Seawater has a different density and a different specific weight than fresh water does. This specific weight is for pure water. But if you took a sample of water from the ocean, the density of that water is higher because of the salt that's dissolved in it. It's above uh, 10,000 newtons per cubic meter. And here's one more really important way of describing fluids, and that is a specific gravity, and it's a ratio. Any fluid, whether it's um, air or mercury or oil or seawater, you can compare how dense that fluid is to the density of a reference fluid. And in most cases, the reference fluid we're going to use is pure water. And so specific gravity, sometimes it's abbreviated in the text by SG. Sometimes it's just abbreviated with the letter S. S means specific gravity. Uh, it's the ratio of the unit weight or the ratio of the density of whatever that fluid is to the property of water. And so that if you had a, uh, a fluid, for example, that has a density of, um, you had a fluid that has a density of 1,000, let me just say we got a density of a fluid of water that's 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, and then we have the unit weight of some oil that is 800 kilograms per cubic meter, then SG would just be 800 divided by 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter divided by 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And so SG is going to be 0 0.8. And what's the units of SG? It has no units. It's just a ratio, because it cancels out. The kilograms per cubic meter divided by kilograms per cubic meter. So what it means is, in this case, the oil has a specific gravity less than 1. That means it would float if it was released on top of the water. But if something has a SG of greater than 1, that means it's more dense than the water, and it would sink in the water. Any questions about this slide? There's a lot of in new information on here. Here's that table that I was mentioning earlier. In your textbook, how many people have already bought the book? So you're going to spend, a few of you have, I think. The rest of you are going to spend a lot of money today, right? Go get the book. Anybody, anybody remember how much it was? I think when I looked it up online, it was like $200. So that's going to be like uh, seven, 800 dirhams. Don't worry, you'll get your money's worth, I promise. All right. One of the ways you'll get your money's worth is using this table, uh, table A5. And what this is showing is the density and the specific weight as a function of temperature. Sometimes on your quizzes and exams, I'm going to give you short answer problems. It's not all calculations. You also have to demonstrate understanding. And so one of the short answer questions that I maybe would give you, and this isn't a promise, it's just an example of how you can get a short answer question in fluid mechanics. Uh, describe the relationship between density and temperature. So if you look at this table, it's clear that as temperature increases, density decreases. 
Anybody want to take a guess at how that is? How does density go down when temperature goes up? Any ideas? That's a good guess because you're right, that as the temperature goes up, uh, water evaporates more quickly. But in this instance, what they've done is they've sealed the liquid so that it doesn't evaporate. Otherwise, it definitely would. At 90 degrees Celsius, the water would be evaporating very quickly. In this case, they're preventing it. And the reason why the density goes down is because the, uh, the water is expanding as the temperature, uh, as the temperature increases. So the amount of mass doesn't change. There's still the same amount of stuff there because they've sealed it to prevent evaporation. But it's taking up more volume. And so the amount of stuff per unit of volume goes down. So that's the relationship. Temperature goes up. The molecules are moving faster, more kinetic energy. So they're bumping into each other. It occupies slightly more space. And that's how the density goes down, is the same amount of mass is now taking up a larger amount of space than it was earlier. Same thing is true for a specific weight. And it's, it's the same, um, same rate. The density and the specific weight are changing at the same rate because this column is simply the density multiplied by what? 9.81. Yeah, so that's the relationship for every one of those rows. Now, it's different for slugs and pounds force. Uh, this column, the unit weight of water, is 32.2 times slugs. But, all right, so here's where we're going to do some calculations today. And um, so you've already learned about fluid properties a little bit, density specific weight, specific gravity, right? And so you can get started on the homework tonight, homework one and homework two. Uh, but elasticity and volume change is talking about the, um, how compressible liquids are. Um, sometimes people say that liquids are incompressible, but I mentioned earlier, I hinted at the fact that actually we can compress them a little bit if we apply a really, really enormous force. And so that's what we're going to take a look at with this slide. And the bulk modulus of elasticity is saying, if we apply a pressure to a liquid, how much the volume is going to change. And so let's look at this formula. E sub V, that's the abbreviation that we give bulk modulus of elasticity. And every fluid has a different bulk modulus. You can look it up in a table. And the bulk modulus changes a little bit based on the temperature. And so you have to look up the right fluid, and you have to look it up at the correct temperature. Um, I'll give you a default value for water in just a moment. But, so that's E sub V. And the formula says uh, the bulk modulus of elasticity is negative dP divided by dV divided by V. All right, and those li the little cross through the V that's strange, right? You don't see that all the time. Sometimes uh, we have um, two different Vs in fluid mechanics. And uh, sometimes we'll use this to mean velocity. And then when there's a V with a cross through it, that means volume. All right. So if you do notice a V with a, a line through it, what they're talking about there is volume. But sometimes the book and I get sloppy, and uh, sometimes I won't put the line in there. And the way that you'd know that means volume is by looking at the units or just from the context of the problem. So, OK. So <clears throat> what this is saying, uh-oh, now I've done it. Let's see if I can get it to stay down. Good enough. All right. V is the initial volume of fluid. It's how much space is being occupied by a certain amount of our fluid. And then if we pressurize it, dP is how much the pressure changes. And so we're using some, si some sort of a press to try and, uh, and really clamp down on this fluid and get it to change its volume. dV is how much it changes. And so dV divided by V, we're calling that a fraction. 
fractional change. And it will, the dV will usually be a very, very small amount compared to the initial volume. It's not going to change much. And just to give you a feel for that, uh, the bulk modulus of elasticity for water is 2.2 times 10 to the ninth pascals. And now here's a new unit that we haven't talked about yet today, a pascal. A pascal, P-A, is the same as a newton per meter squared. So it's the amount of pressure. If you had an area of one meter by one meter, so I don't know, think about these floor tiles here. I think a meter is probably about three tiles. So three tiles by three tiles. And if we put one newton of force spread out over that area evenly, then that's the amount of pressure that is one pascal. Um, <clears throat> so sometimes I'll write newtons per meter squared when we're doing pressure calculations. Sometimes I'll write pascals. And we can just think of them interchangeably because we know a pascal is the amount of pressure when one newton of force is spread out over one square meter of area. <clears throat> so sometimes for problem solving, we'll think of this equation, you know, dp, dv. We'll just put a little delta sign there because uh, we're not always going to be doing calculus and integration. We're just going to be thinking about a change. And so if we have some, in, some initial volume, V is the initial volume, and delta V is how much the volume changed, and usually it'll be a decrease in volume. You know, if we're compressing the fluid, it, the volume is going to get, be getting less. Delta P is how much pressure we applied, and then E sub V is the bulk modulus there. All right. I'd like you to try some calculations through the semester. And so what I'll recommend you do is you can work individually. You can talk to your classmate. When I give you an example like this and I stop talking, that's your time to collaborate with your friends. Uh, you don't have to be quiet. You know, this isn't a museum that we're in right now. Uh, so we have 50 liters of water. And it's initially open to the atmosphere, so just normal atmospheric pressure. And uh, we want to find out how much space will that water occupy if we apply a pressure of 5 megapascals, MPA. And so 5 megapascals, that's 5 times 10 to the 6th pascals. That's what uh, a megapascal is. Yeah, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, Solve for delta V. Use this formula to solve for delta V, and then find out the, once you find the change, then find the total volume occupied by the water. All right. So the time is yours to start calculating that. All right. Let's take a look at this one. Here's my solution. I don't have the best handwriting. You're going to suffer through my bad handwriting all semester long. And then my homework grader is going to suffer through your bad handwriting. I'm sure some of you have good handwriting, probably better than me. So here we have what's given, the given formula. And we sort of uh, change it around a little bit to make it uh, more directly relatable to the way we're solving it. Our initial volume is 50 liters. And we know the bulk modulus of elasticity for water, 2.2 times 10 to the ninth pascals. And then the pressure that's applied, the change in pressure, because it started at atmospheric. And then we do 5 megapascals above and beyond atmospheric pressure. So what's the final volume after we apply that pressure? By the way, this negative sign. What that means, the, the reason why there's a negative sign there, it means that if you apply a positive pressure, the volume is decreasing. And so that there's an opposite direction of the relationship, that a positive pressure decreases the volume. So when we solve for the delta V here, because of that negative sign, that means the change in volume is, oh, I should have written it in my solution there, negative. Uh, 0.114, 
negative 0.114 liters. And so then we combine the two together, the initial volume and the final volume. So the final volume is 49.886 liters because of the uh, change in pressure. So any questions about that example? No? All right. That's where we're going to leave the uh, fluid mechanics stuff today. For the rest of our class period, we're going to be talking about paperwork. All right? So um, let's start with this one. This is the course schedule. And we're starting with this because it's maybe the most important thing you're getting today. It shows you right now on the first day of class what we're doing for the whole semester. It shows you every lecture what we're talking about, what section of the textbook it applies to, and when every assignment is due. When the quizzes are, when the exams are, the final exam, and also your uh, spring break. So it has everything from the semester. So you can see on here, for example, if you look at class number two, we're going to talk about elasticity and viscosity when we get together on Tuesday. And then you can also see under item due, it says introductory assignment. So this one, homework number one, remember I mentioned earlier at the beginning of class that you have to have this uploaded to iLearn before we begin on Tuesday. And then on Sunday, homework 2A is going to be due. So you'll notice there's a homework 2A and 2B. The reason why um, they both have the number 2 is because that goes along with chapter 2. And then A and B, um, I'm trying to split them up into smaller assignments so it's not too overwhelming all at once. I think it's better to have you know, assignment every week instead of a huge assignment every two weeks or every three weeks because then uh, it might be too much all at once. So I think this table is more or less self-explanatory. Um, you see that for our final exam, it's on Thursday the 19th of May. That seems like a long ways in the future. So are there any questions about the course schedule before we move on to the next paper? Keep this in a safe place, but if you uh, lose it, it's also online. It's on iLearn. Okay, here are our course policies. Let's look at this one next. It has my name, Dr. Isaac Waite. My office is on the third floor of the main building. So if you need to come see me, not too far away, it's just third floor, up by the, uh, it's in the same hallway as the Achievement Academy. So there's a few civil engineering faculty up there and then the Achievement Academy. It has my email and phone number. And my office hours are from 10 to 11 and from noon to 1, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. And if you need to see me other times, then send me an email and we can make an appointment. All right. This next uh, paragraph is very important where it says learning environment. I'll read it. Uh, students are expected to attend class meetings on time and ready to learn. So on time means that you're in the classroom by 8 o'clock. I'm going to close the door at 8 o'clock, and if the door is closed, you shouldn't come in. If, if you try to come in, I'll ask you to leave, and it could get ugly. If you don't leave, then I'll leave, and your students won't get a lecture that day, and you'll be the reason for it. So um, you know the, the recordings are online, so if you get stuck in traffic and you're late, then just watch the recording. You know. Uh, but please don't interrupt the class by coming in late. It's very distracting for me and for your classmates. And so um, I'm going to take this semester really seriously. I put a lot of effort into my lectures and a lot of effort into the semester. And I know you will, too. And one of the ways you can take the semester seriously is by being on time and ready to learn. So no students may enter the classroom after the door is closed. Uh, students should already take care of personal needs prior to class. And so that means if you are thirsty and need water, do that before you come in. Don't leave the classroom to get a drink of water, to use the toilet. Just take care of all of your personal needs before the class. Um, students may only attend class meetings corresponding to the section to which they are assigned. Now there's an 8 o'clock class and a 9 o'clock class. I think everyone, myself included, wishes that we could just start at 9 o'clock, right? I like sleeping in. But unfortunately for all of us, we're in the 8 o'clock section. So 
will stay in the 8 o'clock section. Okay. So I'm going to try and make this a warm, welcoming learning environment. I'm going to try and be a friendly guy, but you can't come to class late. Quizzes. We're going to have three quizzes during the semester. They're listed on the schedule here. And the reason why I like these quizzes is it's a lower stake opportunity for you to get a review of, um, to see what my questions are like and to see how well you know the material. So a midterm, that's worth a lot of points. But a quiz is worth fewer points, and so it's just a way for you to check your understanding. Missed quizzes cannot be made up. So if the door is closed and we're having a quiz that day, you can't come into the classroom. You, you're going to have to skip the quiz. Uh, quiz material may come from textbook, lectures, homework, and in-class examples that we do together. Uh, there's two midterm exams and a final. It's listed on the course schedule. Okay, let me read this about homework. Homework should be submitted immediately before class begins on the due date. Uh, what you'll do to submit the homework is just set it on the table, or maybe I'll have a chair sitting next to the table, and so you put your uh, homework in, and then you sit down. And get the other papers too. Uh, late work is not accepted. Students arriving late may not enter the classroom or submit assignments. Uh, be neat and professional. Sloppy or illegible submissions may be penalized or rejected. Show all your work. Here's an important one. Uh, to prevent copying, students should submit assignments themselves and not via another student. There have been some cases in the past where a student said, hey, turn in my homework for me, gave his paper to his friend, and then the friend copied it, and then both students are accused of cheating. Even maybe one didn't know that his friend copied the assignment. Did you have a question? Yeah, go ahead. That, uh, I mean, that's a good question. Only the first one. Homework number one will be submitted on iLearn because it's like paragraphs and it's something you'll type. But the rest of the assignments um, will be calculations, and so you'll bring the actual paper uh, into class. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, I don't mind about a cover page, uh, you know, uh, but only right on one side of the paper. I'm glad you asked that. Um, so no, no cover page is needed, but don't write on both sides of the paper, because that makes it too difficult for the grader. Other questions? All right. So don't let other students copy your homework. Um, our homework assignments, you'll see, are from the textbook. If you look online, you can probably find the solution. And uh, if you use it, if you copy the solution, or if you look at the solution, it's going to make you stupider. You're not going to know the material the way you need to. So that's one of the, the paths to failure, is to use the online PDF of the solution manual. That's a wonderful way to fail in this course. And the wonderful way to succeed in this course is to do the homework yourself, to struggle. It's like if I go to the gym, and I don't go to the gym. You can tell by looking at me. But let's say if I went to the gym and I had someone strong on either side, and I'm doing the bench press and they're lifting it for me, I'm not going to get stronger, right? The way to get stronger is you have to do the struggle yourself. And the same thing is true for your body and for your mind. So if you copy the solution manual from the PDF, number one, I'll probably catch you because there's mistakes in that solution manual online. And if you copy the same mistake that's in that PDF, eventually you'll get caught and thrown out of the class. Uh, but number two, even before that happens, you're going to be uh, stealing your education and wasting your money. All right. So here's some important information about honesty and collaborating with your classmates. I think it's really good if you work together with your friends. But you have to be careful how you do it. It's OK to talk about the homework with another student. That's fine. It's even OK to check your answers, to see if they get the same final answer as you, to ask them. That's fine. And to help someone to, make, uh, to understand and help them find their mistake, that's also OK. That's why there's smiley faces here, because that's, those are all acceptable behaviors. Then you can see the frowny face there for unacceptable behavior. If you show someone every step of a problem, like if you finish the problem already and then you show them your paper, then they are losing the struggle. It's like you're lifting the weight for them and they're not lifting the weight because they see the whole solution from beginning to end and then they don't have to do the growth in their own mind. It's also unacceptable to give your assignment to someone else because of the risk that they would copy it. 
And also here for the frowny face, I have group working problems simultaneously. What that means is let's say four people are sitting at the same table in a circle, and they're working on the same homework problem at the same time. That's not allowed. Anyone want to guess why I say that's not allowed? If four people are sitting together at the same time working on the problem, what's the problem with that? Why is that bad? I think you know. Anyone be brave and explain why it's not a good idea? No one brave? Not today. Not on the first day. We don't know each other yet. It's because one person is always the fastest. And they're not necessarily the smartest, it's just they can solve the problems faster. And so the other three people are just going to follow whoever's fastest. And they're going to lose the opportunity to learn. If everyone's sitting together, then three people aren't learning, one person maybe is learning. So it's OK to talk about homework, but don't do every step of the problem together. You can also see the weighting of the grades and the grade scale. And so assignments, 16%, quizzes, 12%, and so on. I'm going to put the grade book on iLearn. Anytime you want to know your grade through the whole semester, you can log on to iLearn, and it will have all of the up-to-date information for your grade. So you can exactly see what your percentage is. So any questions on these course policies? OK, the last thing, here is the syllabus. I won't go into detail about the syllabus, but if you have any questions, you can look it over outside of class and let me know. The last thing I'll remind you about is this introductory assignment. How are you submitting it? I learn. When are you submitting it? Tuesday by 7.59 AM. So you might as well just uh, do it Monday night, right? Let's take one look, la last look at these announcements here. OK, buy the book, get started on the introductory assignment, and uh, just start off on the right foot. Get an early start on homework 2A. Think about how good that would feel to start solving these problems on the first day of class and say, wow, I'm really, I'm getting ahead of it this semester. I'm working on two homework assignments on the first day. That'd be pretty good, right? All right, so this recording will be online later today. So there's a link on iLearn where you click on that link, it'll take you to my YouTube channel, and then all of my class videos are found there. So have a great day. I'll see you on Tuesday.